So thanks for um, coming, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I hope that this talk will give you an example of what people use Node.js for in the real world, um, outside of just big companies and uh, web applications. So uh, my project is called DAT, um, D-A-T, and this is kind of a state of the project as of late 2014. Um, and my name is Max Ogden, and I'm based in Oakland, California. The uh, world capital of Node.js and tacos and bicycles. Um, I, in my spare time, I organized the Node School event, which the first one in, um, or there, there was a Node School that just finished up across the hallway. And Node School is um, all the stuff that the uh, people who've been doing Node for a few years um, know. We put it into fun interactive workshops so you can install them on the command line and learn Node from really awesome tutorials. So check it out. And I also really love cats. Um, this is a cat that I took a photo of yesterday at a cat cafe in Singapore. And cat cafes are the best thing ever. Um, but OK, so why I'm here is to talk about my open source project called DAT. And DAT is uh, a tool for sharing and collaborating on data. And those are two different challenges. Um, sharing is just getting access to the data, uh, either publishing or installing. And then collaborating is even more advanced. So <laughs> Um, the life cycle of a data set as different people use it, trying to build a tool set so that data can kind of live um, and be contributed to by lots of people. Um, it's very similar. We're inspired to uh, on, on the project by the Git tool for source code, but um, data and source code are a lot different. Um, so not all the same tools work in both places. It's about a year old, or a little bit over a year old, and um, we're not a startup. A lot of people think that we're a startup because we have a logo, but I think open source projects and have logos too. Um, we're a grant funded project and everything we do is open source. So there's lots of ways to um, get involved and we have lots of projects. Um, we're grant funded by an organization in the US that funds um, improvements to the way that science is done. So most of our use cases are focused on scientific use cases. We work with a lot of scientists, but I'm, I don't have any college experience. I have a high school diploma and I've been writing JavaScript for like eight years. So. I'm not a scientist, I just pretend to be one. Um, and I like to learn, so it's really fun to work with scientists. But um, this organization that funds us is um, committed to making science more reproducible and easier to get involved with. So a lot of scientists will publish papers, and other scientists will say, hey, I can't reproduce your results. What's, what gives? And that's, a lot of people think that's not science. If you can't reproduce the results in science, it isn't science. It's only science if there's a test suite, basically. Um, so we're trying to bring some of the software development stuff that people have figured out for these large-scale um, software projects, trying to integrate it into the scientific workflows a little bit. We specifically focus on data sets. Um, this is our team. We have a really awesome team. Um, a lot of people have day jobs and they contribute to our project, but we pay everyone from our budget. And um, everybody has a different expertise. So for instance, Bruno here is a DNA researcher and he has a server cluster at his university with 512 gigs of RAM on it, and he does DNA sequencing. So it's really fun to run DAT on a machine with half a terabyte of RAM. Um, and we just have a really cool background, uh, lots of cool backgrounds on the team. Um, but what brings us all together is we all work in, with Node.js in various ways. Um, there's lots of documentations, documentation that we've written for the project. One example is um, we've been working on the project for a year, and it has a lot of different components, but since uh, when you make a big thing in Node.js, you end up not just writing it all in one repo, you make a lot of modules. We have written or we use a lot of modules and we took the time to document all the modules we use so you can get an example of kind of when we're solving a problem, what tools from NPM we use. And you can find this just in the dat repo on GitHub. Um, oh, I should also mention the slides here are available. Um, I also tweeted them out, but they're available on um, GitHub pages. There's a URL here, but um, just either check my Twitter or Check out my slides repo on GitHub if you want to see the links and stuff. So um, to kind of set the stage for um, understanding that um, there's already a, a concept most people are familiar with in coding is source control. So um, has anyone done coding um, and not used Git or another source control solution? Anybody remember pre-Git before Git took over the world? Yeah, so it was crazy. Um, 
So say, say you, you find a cool project and you want to fix something and send the author a fix. Um, you have to get a zip file and maybe it's on their personal page, maybe it's on SourceForge or pre-SourceForge, maybe it's on a mailing list. Um, you have to unpack it somewhere on your machine and then you make your edit and then you email the file back uh, to the author and hope that the author gets it. Um, but, you know, for instance, what happens if you fix a bug and email your fix, and then at the same time someone else fixes a bug and emails their fix? Um, all that work has to go through the author. Like, now it's the author, the maintainer's job to fix all the conflicts. But you can't see that you um, maybe broke the other person's patch, and you can't take the initiative to fix it yourself. So it ends up bottleneck, there's a big bottleneck on the maintainer. And if they're busy, then the things might not get fixed for a really long time. Um, so they have ultimately have to make a new zip file of the project that might contain your fix, might not, maybe they edited it a lot, there's not really a way to see what they track changes with. Um, and then they redistribute the zip file. Um, and it's just a total mess, like there's, there's no way to see history, you can't check out code to an old version. Um, and then Git came along and basically modernized it by creating a language for collaboration. So you, instead of unzipping and downloading, you just clone. And then you can edit with your own tools. So, you know, Git didn't reinvent everything. They didn't reinvent the text editor uh, until this year. But they, then you add files and you commit and you push and then everything is tracked. Um, and the author, um, if the author sees you send a patch and sees someone else send a patch, they can just, um, you know, now that GitHub is here, GitHub came along, and you can actually see when you do things like break the build, break the test suite, uh, break somebody else's patch, and the author can communicate with you. So it really it just opens up this whole world of collaboration. And a lot of us are already familiar with this workflow, but, um, you know, when you want to get the newest version, you don't have to download a new file, you just get toll. Um, so our kind of operating assumption is that data sharing is back in the days before Git. It's the same, you know, source code figured it out first um, about 10 years ago, all these nice source code tools that we all use, modern, modern distributed source code started hitting the world and data sharing um, does not have any of these tools. So what motivated me to get started on the project was, you know, here's the workflow we have now. Email a CSV file around, um, you can do things like put your SQLite database into Git and check it into GitHub, but there's file size limits and it doesn't support like real-time data. Um, so our goal of the project at a high level is we wanna take the transformational change that Git enabled without literally copying all the stuff that Git did um, and just adapt it for data and try to build a collaboration system for data sets. So dat is a module on NPM. You can NPM install dash g dat and it has a couple po components. One is there's a command line tool and another one is there's a web server. So you can host a dat online so other people can clone from you. So it's both a client and a server, depending on if you're consuming data or distributing data. Um, and here's an example workflow. You might um, do a dat init to create a new dat store in a repo, just like git init, and then you um, just use any tool you want that produces either JSON or CSV data, and you can pipe it into a dat import. And then when you want to share your data, you can run dat listen somewhere, and then you can give that URL for your server to someone else and they can clone from you. Um, so, Oh yeah, so I have my, um, I, I did, got my genome sequenced by one of these cloud services, and it's, you know, hundreds of thousands of A, C, T's, and G's. And so, I, for example, I can uh, take this file, and let me bump up the zoom a little bit. So if I um, cat my genome, then you'll see it's, uh, you know, a lot of these um, basic uh, phenotypes. And it, every gene has an ID and a position, and then, um, it's just a bunch of raw genetic data, and they actually distribute it in uh, TSV format instead of CSV format. Um, so if I wanted to um, start revision controlling myself, um, I can go and make a new folder called genome, and then go into genome and data init, and it'll ask me a couple questions like uh, my genetic data and publisher is myself, and now I have an empty dat store. What it actually does under the hood is uh, makes uh, database inside of here, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But now I can actually run my imports. So if I go to here, and so I'm going to use a CSV parser to parse the data into JSON. So now I've converted it from TSV into JSON, and that means that I can just add dat imports 
uh, JSON to the end, and then it'll um, import my data into the data store. And so it'll start parsing the data, and it, so it's parsed you know, 60,000 of my genes, and it's gonna sit there and then import the data set until it finishes importing, but it usually takes uh, a little while, so I will just cancel it, and so now I can cat myself out. Well, I guess it didn't commit any of the changes, but the idea is you, know, you import data into that, and then now you can track the, um, that, that's basically the import process. And once data is in that, then you can replicate it to other places. Um, so you can also clone. So uh, if you have a data set URL for someone else that's hosting that, um, you can clone a data set down. And um, then once you have a data set that you've cloned, if you want to get all the changes, you can just pull. So this simplifies a lot of the workflow that you see in data set consumption. A lot of times when you're working with data sets, you'll either get uh, you know, an FTP server with like a CSV file, and the CSV might update every night at midnight, but you have to download the CSVs and kind of dip them yourself and figure out which data you have already imported, and it just becomes like this much code that you have to write every time. So we wanted to reduce the amount of code down to just the dat pull commands. So you can just type dat pull, you get the newest stuff without having to re-download the entire thing. Um, and we also support live pull, which is a pretty, pretty cool feature. Um, everything inside of DAT uses Node, and because we use Node, we can support a lot of real-time stuff. So we, everything is a stream, and that means that um, you can just have your DAT sitting there listening like Dropbox, getting the latest data um, as, it, as it exists on the server. Um, and we also support um, large file attachments. So you can put movies or photos or you know, treat DAT kind of like a file system. And our back end is that we use a database called LevelDB by default. And LevelDB is a pretty cool database. You can um, check it out. It's written by Google, and it's, um, it's not really a database in the traditional sense, like MySQL or MongoDB. It's more like a database library that you can use to build your own database. So it's just a C++ library that um, does one small job really well, and you can kind of build your database on top of it. And we also, um, for storing bigger files that belong on the file system and not inside of a database, we have a thing called blob stores. And blob, blob is just a binary large object. It's just a weird programmer word for basically an attachment. And um, we have an API called the abstract blob store that any time we want to write um, an adapter for DAT that saves data somewhere um, on a file system, we can use this API. And this has like a little test suite and so, for instance, if you wanted to have a DAT that uploads to S3 when you upload a file into DAT, but you don't want to write any S3 code, you can just use the S3 blob store. If you want to have one that works with Dropbox, you can use the Dropbox blob store. So it's kind of um, it's a nice abstraction layer around file storage. And one of the things that we're motivated to do is make it so if somebody publishes one of these plugins, then other people can just use the plugins instead of having to write their custom code again. Um, so we have you know things like store the files on the local file system, on FTP. Um, we're trying to just make, uh, you know, what Node.js is really good at is um, just move data around. And we want to make this API, this blob store API, something that has every popular file storage backend supported by it. So you can just plug in the right thing into that of where you want your files to end up, and Node will stream them from A to B. Um, so some other stuff that we do um, is we generate a schema for you automatically, which can be annoying sometimes. We give you a free REST API for your data, so you don't have to build your own non-standard REST API for just letting people download your data. And everything in that is um, streaming, which means it supports arbitrarily large data sets without crashing the server. So you can upload terabytes of data, and it doesn't crash. It just might take longer. So OK, concrete example. Um, so uh, we have the NPM data set that we've imported into DAT because traditionally, you know, cloning NPM is um, really difficult and installing the dependencies to run your own NPM locally is really difficult. So we've been experimenting with putting NPM into DAT so we can treat NPM as um, just a nice, easy to use data set. So um, we have a data set up at npm.dathub.org. DATHub is just like kind of a test domain that we've been playing with. And so, the data set has you know, a little over 100,000 rows, one um, row for every module in NPM, but we also store revisions of each. So every time a, published, a module gets published, we store a new version and the old version. And then we have links to the actual file. So we just basically store a bunch of JSON from NPM, but then we also link to the actual um, files themselves. So when you want to get the actual, um, NPM stores everything as tarballs. So when you want to actually get the tarball, we have a link to the tarball. 
And um, the link is in a format that that can understand and translate. It'll go and fetch the tarball from NPM and download it for you. So what this means is you can take this URL, and um, if I go back up to my desktop, I can say dat clone the URL. And by default, what it'll do is start downloading all of the data from NPM, both the metadata, which are the row data, um, as well as the tarball data. Um, and then I get a full offline clone of the entire NPM registry. So this will take a long time because A, I'm on conference Wi-Fi, and B, but it is actually working, and B, um, the NPM data set is uh, upwards of 100 gigabytes. So this will sit there overnight, and, it, and it'll fill up your hard drive with all the NPM data. But you know, if you have 100 gigabytes to spare, you can, use all of, you can download all of NPM onto your laptop so you can have it offline. But I'm going to cancel that and then um, start over. So um, if I delete the NPM folder and then run it again, but this time add the skim option. Let me make sure I'm following. Yeah, so dash dash skim. Um, this means don't download the files, just download the metadata. It's a lot faster. So you'll notice now um, it's only downloading, it's not downloading any of the actual blobs, it's just downloading the um, JSON data from NPM, which means if later you want to go and get one of the files, um, if I, you know, I'll kill this, go into there, run dat listen, um, oops, and then open up uh, my local host, then I have, um, you know, the 845 rows that I just pulled are now running in local dat, and if I view one of these, then this is a link to one of those tarballs, but if I click it, then um, only then will that go and fetch the file and then let me download it. So I can download the tarball kind of lazily. Um, so you can either choose, do you want all the files up front, which is like, you know, it's slower to download at first, or do you want to get the files later? And then you can download just the metadata for a data set. Um, and this kind of distinction is just really nice when you're dealing with really big data sets. You can kind of program more flexibly. Um, so. We can also do some cool stuff once we have NPM data. Um, like, let's calculate, you know, have you ever wondered how many gigabytes is NPM actually? So we would have to basically loop through every row, um, loop through every file on every package, and get the file size, and then just add it all. And then when we are done, we can figure out what the total size of all of NPM is. Um, so I, just like a good cooking show, I have prepared um, a full copy. Oh. Uh, I've cloned, this, this morning at the breakfast place in the hotel, I cloned all of NPM. So this one, um, if I open up this server, this one actually has uh, all 113,000 modules um, that have been published to NPM, but it's running locally, so I can um, access them offline. And I have this little file here, and basically what this does um, is opens up the DAT, um, in the current directory, and then uh, creates a dat read stream, which basically loops through every row in all of dat, one at a time. And for each one, I just add the size of each file um, to a, a big summary byte size. And so it, you'll see if I run this, um, then it'll just start streaming through all the rows in dat and just calculating the ultimate file, file size. And you know this takes uh, a minute to run because it has to loop through all of NPM, but at the very end, then you'll get the final file size of all of NPM. So that's just a pretty trivial example of doing something with a uh, DAT stream, um, but there's another cooler one that I can do. Um, oh yeah, so this is the link to the source code if you go to the slides. And um, the idea with that is that you use uh, Unix pipes. So you can do, for instance, dat cat to cat out all the rows in dat and pipe them into whatever you want. So you don't have to write your tools in Node you can do anything that you can write on the command line. So you can write stuff in Python, R, like any language that you can write a command line API for, you can use with that. Um, and you can also use Docker if you don't want to have your users, um, you know, if you're like, oh, I wrote this really cool Python thing, but it requires a certain version of Python, and you know, here's like a 30 minute instruction for how to actually get everything compiled. And by the way, one of the Python modules uses C++, so you have to install you know, Xcode before you can compile it, or Windows Visual Studio on Windows. And it's just, you know, if you don't want to have to have all that setup stuff, um, we, we really like Docker as a way of just, you know, you publish just a Docker container that has all your stuff pre-compiled, and then the user just has to install Docker, and then they can just run your thing. Um, they don't have to compile anything. So um, we're compatible with that, too, and you can actually stream data into Docker. So for instance, um, you know, NPM, part of the metadata on NPM is uh, they have all the readmes actually in here. Um, so 
part of their, uh, one of the attributes on their JSON is they have like the full markdown for um, the modules for, from the readme in the JSON. So um, since we have all the readmes, we can do stuff like, um, where is, yeah, so, so for instance, here's a DAT query that you can do. So you can pass some arguments to DAT cat. Um, so I'll get all rows that are greater than or equal to the word DAT, but only get five of them. And um, so that'll get the last five modules. Um, it's kind of hard to read because it's a lot of data, but you know, I got like, there's a module that's tracking Ebola data in DAT. There's a module that is, um, the actual DAT module will get uh, returned here. So basically this just gets the first five DAT modules on NPM. And then if I pipe them into, we've created this um, bulk markdown to PNG Docker container. So what it does is you pipe it um, some JSON data that has markdown in it. And then for each one that it gets, it um, opens up that markdown in a headless web browser and it takes a screenshot of the rendered markdown, saves it as a PNG, adds a PNG to a tarball, and then streams the tarball data back out to you. So you can convert a bunch of markdown files into a tarball full of PNGs. So if I run this really quick, um, it takes a second because it has to boot up, you know, get the data out of, the da out of DAT, boot up the um, Docker container, but now I should have this pngs.tar file that just got created. And if I extract that, then I get these PNGs of the five modules that um, it just streamed in. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that um, I just did it in one command. You know, all you have to do is clone NPM, that's one command, and then pipe the data into the uh, data processing pipeline. And this is something that people in science, well, all programmers do it, but people in science specifically do it, and they have such crazy dependency issues. So, um, we're trying to just make this stuff as easy as possible and use the most modern tools possible so that um, instead of rewriting, you know, I could do this in Bash or I could do this in Node, but we really like command line. We really, really like things that are easy to install. So that's kind of our motivating, um, that's our motivation. So another thing that we built is um, this thing called git dat. And um, this is kind of uh, inspired by Node School. So for instance, um, let me make sure I'm still connected here. Yeah, so this is actually just available on, um, online. It's um, just called git dat, but um, it's hosted on GitHub pages. And what, we are, what you're looking at here is um, an environment for learning dat interactively. So when you load this page, it actually, we're running a server on the back end um, that as a new user connects, it creates them a new virtual um, Ubuntu machine. Um, we have a template Docker container that we can boot up a new instance of the container. It has DAT pre-installed, it has Node pre-installed. Um, and so this user um, gets their own custom Docker container here. So for instance, this is the ID for this container. And this is all just running client side, but we emulate actually a terminal. And we connect to the actual terminal session on the new server over a WebSocket. So I'm actually logged in as root to a real Ubuntu <coughs> machine, but it's running sandbox. So um, you know, I can't like delete the machine or anything. I could just mess with my little sandbox. Um, so for instance, I can type here, um, you know, I could create a new file. I could say touch foo.txt. And then um, down here, we actually wrote a little text editor. So you can open up foo.txt and you can type into it like hi. And then now if I cat foo.txt, then, you know, it prints out hi. So we've connected the, the server that you're an actual Ubuntu server on the back end with a little terminal so you can run commands and also expose the file system to the browser so you can edit it right in the browser as a kind of text editor. I can also do stuff like npm install, um, like I have a module called cat picture. You can npm install stuff. And as npm is working, um, you know, it's going and fetching the module from npm and you'll see, you'll see the actual folders um, get created here as it downloads the, the stuff. So now I have an actual little node modules folder. I can go in and view the module that I I just required, I can edit its source code in here. And, you know, so you have like a full little development environment. It also comes with DAT preloaded. Um, so you can actually host um, a little server in here. So, uh, and, and just send this link to somebody and they can open up your server. So you should try this workshop out. Workshop out. It's free. It's, um, it's just called Get DAT. I think if you actually just go to the DAT readme, um, you can get a link to this. And there's on this pane over here, we have the actual tutorial. And it gives you instructions on how to play with different parts of DAT, and it gets kind of more difficult as it goes along. Um, so this is something that we just recently shipped, and um, we've been really excited about, because it kind of just makes the barrier of entry as low as possible. Um, so 
I want to talk about one of our use cases just to give you an example of like, you know, okay, so there's these cool tools, but what actually is the data that we're using? Um, so there's these, this project called Trillion, and they, what they do is they are a bunch of astronomers, and they have you know, these big astronomy telescopes that are at universities, and they do these scans of the universe where they'll, they'll like take a picture and then move it a little bit, take another picture, move it a little bit, and it takes them years to do, and, but what they, what they end up with is all this imagery of every star that's visible in the whole sky. Some of them aren't the entire sky, some of them are just parts of the sky, but it's a lot of data, and it's a lot of stars. And then what they do is they run an algorithm over all of this, the images, and they detect all the stars and the positions of the stars in the sky, um, how big they are, you know, what frequencies of light they were able to detect, and they get all this metadata about every star. So then you get text to data, like um, basically a big CSV. Um, but they're huge files, and they're in an astronomy format that is like kind of just a specialized format that only astronomers use. So even if other astronomers want to use it, they might not be familiar with the weird format that the other astronomers use. And also, it's just um, to download like one star in the sky, you might have to download a 10 gigabyte chunk of the sky because they only distribute them in these big files. There's no real database they're using. Um, an example of the scale of the data, I mean, the universe is a very big place. Um, there, so for just one of these data sets from one researcher, they produced, after compression, a terabyte of CSVs because it's um, 600 million stars that they detected in their scan. And then for each star, there's 30 different attributes that they recorded. So 30 different numbers that they wrote down, um, that they extracted from their telescope data. And that ends up being, um, or sorry, not 30, 300 columns. Um, so it's a, a CS, imagine opening a CSV in Excel and it has 300 columns and 600 million rows. So that's the data set that we're working with. And that data was actually extracted from the raw imagery and they sometimes want the raw imagery too, and that's 40 terabytes of just pictures. So what they really want to do, um, this is what they release it as now. It's just a, a HTML table that links to all these you know, nine gigabyte CSV files. Um, and basically what this is saying, uh, this, these numbers here in the deck range covered, is it's saying there's 15 million stars in this file and it's this region of the sky. So if you want to download just one star, you can't just download that one star. You have to download the other 15 million stars next to it before you can extract the one star. Um, and the download takes overnight, and it's just you know, a super, super painful. You can't really do a quick experiment with this kind of data. So I built this little tool recently. I've been getting into astronomy now because of this project, um, just to kind of visually explain. So this is a bounding box in the sky, and this is using the Google Sky tiles. It's basically Google Maps, but they, um, they use astronomy data. And um, what we really want, what a lot of these astronomers want, is they want to take this bounding box and they want to say, you know, I want this part of the sky, so I want the rectangle to be, you know, the center of this galaxy. And, oh, can't click the thing. So they want to basically, like, pick out a range of the sky and then say, um, save, and then zoom in on that. And then they get this little coordinate, these coordinates down here. And they want to plug these coordinates, which represents this rectangle, into a database and basically just download that rectangle. Um, without, you know, and the rectangles that they get with these CSV files are really big, and if they just want one star, they'll make a really tiny rectangle, and they just want to say, just download the data from just this area, uh, but they can't do that easily. So what we did is we figured out a way to import it into DAT. Um, there's these things called geohashes, which are pretty cool, and geohashes take like a X and a Y coordinate, or like a latitude, longitude, um, they actually use a thing very similar to latitude, longitude, and space, but it's called right ascension and declination. Um, but it's basically x and y coordinate, just like a two-dimensional plot. And it combines for, you know, maybe your x is one and your y is one. You can take that point, one comma one, and you can turn it into this address. Um, and the address is just like a text address. And really what it means is, you know, E would be like a big rectangle over one half of the sky. EB would be all of E, but then B is like another smaller rectangle inside of E. The more letters you have, the more zoomed in it is. It's kind of like Google Maps zoom levels. Um, so what we can do is, um, you know, we found out a pretty simple way to index it all in that. And you can actually build a query system on top of it where you take that rectangle that you get from the web app and um, that actually creates. So, you know, if I wanted to query the, the region from 305 to 306 and from negative 1.27 to, to negative 1.26, um, you know, a rectangle, um, then I can query it out of DAT by just creating all these um, query, query ranges. So basically, you know, it gets everything from 
GZZ, uh, PQ, P, PGPGPY to PGPGZ. Um, you know, so it basically creates, it figures out where all the rectangles it needs to query are, and then it goes and queries them from the database. Um, so this is just meant to show that um, if you can find out a cool way of indexing your data, you know, coming up with the primary key for your data, importing it into DAT, you can usually do some pretty cool stuff to query it. Um, but one big caveat with that is, and it's also because of LevelDB, which we use. LevelDB isn't, you know, SQL, it doesn't have SQL in it. So if you really want to do crazy queries like show me all restaurants that are in Singapore that are open from five to six that have cats in them, um, which is a query that I wanted to do yesterday. You can't really do those kind of complicated queries. You can't do joins. Um, so if you get beyond anything like the level of complexity here, um, then you shouldn't really put your database into DAT and that's the end of the road. Really what DAT does for you is lets you just stream the data from the remote source into your machine and then keep streaming it into other places. So one of the um, use cases we're also pushing towards is you might have a Redis database or a Postgres database, and whereas you can't necessarily take Postgres and just tell it, you know, stream data from this server down and just have a live copy of the data, because um, Postgres doesn't have stuff to copy, you know, all the stuff that DAT has, you can just put it into DAT first and then have DAT put it into Postgres for you. So um, that's a, a thing that we're building tools out for as well. Um, and then another use case of ours is you know, take the universe and zoom in all the way down to um, the atomic level. We're doing a project called BioNode, which is a DNA researcher who is wrapping all these hard to use bioinformatics tools and putting them on P NPM. So Bio BioNode is really cool because um, you get all the advantages of dependency management with NPM, so you can just NPM install stuff, but you don't necessarily have to, you know, compile C to get the stuff to work. Um, it, it can just be made a lot more easy. And then you can also use Node to stream the data between these tools um, and just use them on the command line. So part of this project is to figure out how to build really complicated data pipelines and to do the dependency management for those pipelines and to make sure everything streams between everything. Um, because with DNA, you need to download the DNA, and that's what that does, is go and get the data from wherever it is. It's usually on these big government servers or on university servers. You want to stream it down, and then you want to pipe it into your actual analysis pipeline. And that could be composed of a Python script, an R script, a C script, um, a whole bunch of stuff, and you want to make sure the data flows into all of them efficiently. Um, so for instance, this is a Docker file. This is what a Docker file looks like. And this Docker file actually installs this thing called SAMTools, and SAMTools is a very popular um, genetic sequencing command line tool written in C++. Notoriously hard to install. So what we've done is created a script that installs it and then puts it in a Docker container. So you can just use the Docker container without actually having to compile and learn all of this stuff. Um, if you're like a sysadmin, it's not that big of a deal, but most users aren't. Um, so they, they don't want to know how to debug their path and stuff like that. Um, and then this is uh, what SAMTools looks like. It's actually it's pr a pretty cool app because it shows you genetic information like A, C, T's, and G's, um, but on the command line. And it's kind of a fun little thing. But um, the command we're running is we're actually doing Docker run with our SAMTools container and then just piping the data into it um, from DAT. So the whole idea with our use of Docker is um, you know, get it working on the author's machine, and then when you publish it, another scientist can use it and know it's the same code that you ran. So it's, it's towards the goal of reproducibility. Um, and we've also been experimenting with some other approaches. These are definitely more experimental, but um, you know, bash scripts are awesome, except when the Windows user wants to use them, um, or you know, when people write bash that gets out of control. So we've been playing around with this thing called gasket, and this is what gasket syntax looks like. Um, it's just JSON, and you put all the commands you want to pipe together into JSON, and then um, you can use Gasket, which uses, basically, it's just a Node.js program that will run your pipeline for you. And um, one thing that Bash can't really do that well is a, an operation where maybe you want to download something, spawn 50 processes, you know, parallel process them, and then when they're all done, aggregate all the results and then do something else with that. Um, you really kind of have to write a Node.js script or some other kind of dynamic programming language script to do that kind of stuff. Um, but we're trying to make it easy so you can still have like a configuration language for doing it. So this is a few pipelines with Gasket where you can do stuff like import some data into DAT um, from a, a bioinformatics server and then actually do a bunch of metadata analysis on it, download a bunch of data sets, and then actually sequence the data, um, which is this burroughs wheeler alignment thing, which is a DNA sequencing thing. So it's you know, wrapping all these tools in just an easy to read config language, 
But even this isn't the level of uh, easiness that we want because you, know, you still have to use JSON, and if you forget a comma, then it'll blow up if you use single quotes. So we've even been playing with this thing called dat scripts, which is actually vaporware right now. We're just designing it still. It's not implemented, but um, it's kind of like a pipeline config language. So um, this is kind of what dat script looks like. So it just kind of looks like a bash script. But you can say, OK, here's my pipeline called reads, and it wants to be three, these three commands. And you can do stuff like, say, run this one, and then fork this one. So you know, run this command, and then for every piece of output from the run command, then fork it into four separate pipelines. So pipe each piece of data into these four, and then pipe all of the output of that into a dat. Um, and, or for instance, you, know, you can get more complicated and do pipes into other pipes. And it's kind of just like a high level expressive language for complicated data flow scenarios. Uh, but a lot of scientists need this kind of stuff. So um, the future of the project, um, this has all been stuff that's implemented so far, except for that last slide. But kind of where we're headed in the future, let me make sure um, that I didn't forget. Yeah, OK, cool. Um, is we want to have uh, the collaboration stuff that I mentioned at the beginning. We're still building that stuff out. So for, in for instance, in Git, you have two different branches. Like We just have one branch right now. It's just hard-coded. There's only one branch of the data. Um, and so we want to be able to have multiple branches so you can have kind of version A of the data. You can have version B. You can send somebody your branch, and they can have a diffing tool that views the differences between the data on the two branches. Um, this checkout is actually a huge one. Um, you know, imagine you publish a scientific paper, or you publish a script, a bash script, that has to download data from DAT. If you just say dat checkout, or if you just say dat clone, you'll get the latest copy of the data. So if on a Monday you do a dat clone, it'll get the data as it was on Monday. But then if somebody runs the same dat clone on Friday, there might be a whole bunch of new data from that week. So we're adding a feature called checkout, where you'll get basically a commit hash. And you can actually check out a copy of the data set at a specific version in time, deterministically. So um, for reproducibility, this is huge. So basically, a scientist could say, Here's not only the data set command to download the data set, but here's the exact version of the data set that I use. Um, so you can totally reproduce all my results. And then um, we also are really interested in live replication between multiple people. Um, because that is all streaming and real time, you can start doing really cool use cases where, for instance, you know, if the government publishes a data set to one of its servers, then you can download it to your DAT server and import it into DAT, and then somebody might whenever you update your DAT, like stream it into their server that combines it with some other data set, and then somebody can stream that down to their laptop. So you can start building these really cool server-to-server um, -server pipelines. And uh, I mentioned the synchronization to databases use case. For instance, you know, when data arrives on your laptop, automatically put it into my Postgres table under these columns, um, kind of automated data set sync for databases. And then the most exciting one at the very bottom, in my opinion, is we're building a data set registry. So Carissa, who's on our team, is um, building basically, uh, imagine NPM, but instead of Node.js modules, we're going to be able to let people publish data sets. Um, so that's coming, you know, hopefully end of the year, the first alpha of that, um, so that it's really easy to find data sets and just get the dat clone command to clone them. Um, so our project, like I mentioned, is fully open source. Um, we're really active on Freenode, and I really like this app called IRC Cloud. Um, that's free to try out, or five bucks a month if you want to have it keep you logged in all the time. Um, they have a really nice mobile app, shameless plug. I don't know the people that run it, but uh, the Dat IRC channel is where we do most of our development and linking to modules and talking about stuff. And um, then there's also uh, the Dat repo has a lot of docs and good getting started tutorials on it. Um, so um, thank you very much. Thanks, Max. From astronomy to Ebola to human genome. Wow. I'm sure we can get a couple of questions on open data, science sets. All right. Um. Hey, this looks amazing. I'm really excited about using it. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that you are not personally a scientist. But I was just wondering if you've engaged with the computer science community um, of course, there's a lot of conferences specifically just devoted to database design and development and, and mm. how they might view this work. Oh, good question. Um, so yeah, our outreach strategy is um, not just go to JavaScript conferences. Um, everything is written in Node and it's all JavaScript, but we like to, so we like to be, um, well, basically we're getting paid to work with scientists. So even though it's a lot of fun to write Node.js, not a lot of scientists write Node.js. So we've been going to a lot of uh, bioinformatics meetups, 
Um, database meetups, we haven't gone to, or like conferences, um, we haven't gone to as many of them, but um, our outreach strategy is basically you know, make something that developers like to use, but also make something that scientists can use at the same time. So it's kind of two goals that are um, different, but I think that we can achieve both of them. Um, but in terms of the actual data model, we've been getting um, some really cool contributions from people on figuring out better data structures, you know, all sorts of distributed system stuff. Um, one thing that that doesn't do is kind of multi-server data sets. So it all kind of assumes right now, it's at, still at an alpha stage. Uh, I should have mentioned we're not 1.0 yet. Um, but we're, uh, all of our data sets assume you can track them on one machine, and there's this whole field of distributed computing and distributed computation, computation that you know, maybe in a year or two we'll be able to devote the right amount of time to. But I mean, the one thing I've learned about this project so far is that it touches on almost every field of computer science, it seems like, because we throw all the science stuff in and all the database stuff, and it's just a very ambitious, broad project. So we've, we've been trying to start with baby steps so far. Hey, Max, thanks for the talk. Um, you just touched on something that I wanted to ask about, which is it seems like some of this data processing stuff would dovetail really nicely with big data and Hadoop or that whole ecosystem. Do you see any future connecting with that stuff? Or are there other tools that do similar things, but on a more distributed scale? How, how are things related? Good question. Um, so I would say the way our project fits in with like the quote unquote big data stuff um, is we're very community driven and open source friendly. We really, we really want to keep the barrier of entry really low. And the value I see in DAT is making these systems that are designed by different organizations be able to talk to each other through our use of like plugins and modules. So for instance, if you have like a Hadoop analysis cluster and then you have um, you know, some data source like you want to import, for instance, all this astronomy data, um, you would use DAT to hook up the raw data into your Hadoop cluster. So we actually have a thing called our module wish list. Um, and it is on this discussion. Um, we have a repo that's just basically like our discussion board. And um, our wish list we've been putting together is basically everything that we want people to write in terms of adapters. And we have the ones that we've already written. And then we have all these ones that are up for grabs. And Hadoop was one of the first ones that people added here. So, you know, this is kind of the vision for DAT. You know, we're still alpha, but we want to, you know, maybe in a year's time, be able to take any of these services and make them sync to each other. So you can, not, you can stop writing custom scripts that is like a CouchDB to MySQL importer uh, that only works between those two things, and you can instead just use DAT to talk between any of these. So we can achieve a really cool kind of network effect. Um, so I think, you know, you, you're doing your analysis on these big Hadoop clusters, but how do you get your data into them? That's really where DAT comes in. Awesome, that was a lot of inspiring uh, note on big data, huge data. So thank you, Max. Uh, maybe we can uh, catch hold of him at the breaks. I'm sure all oh, yeah. of us have more questions to Max. Thank you. Thanks.